hello and welcome to the next show of Being Well. The show that strives to create awareness of consciousness and humanity. And we want to bring a positive contribution to humanity. I'm Marihan and I will be your host. In today's show, we will do some energy healing one-on-one. -on -one, and then we're going to have a look at how to create vegan nachos the healthy way. After that, Emily McNabb is going to show us how to incorporate yoga twist into our daily life. And lastly, we will look at the triumphs and tragedies of secondhand smoke. But let's not waste any time. Let's go over to Energy Healing 101. Energy Healing 101. The most important part of energy healing is the power of the mind. We live in a vibrational universe and we can change the vibrations around us through our own vibration. That is why it is so important to always have a positive attitude and have the right intentions because we have the power within us to change the vibrations around us. In the next segment, Teal Scott from Author in the Sky is going to demonstrate for us how energy healing is working. Let's take a look. Today I'm going to teach you basic energy healing 101. Energy healing is its own life subject. You could basically donate your entire life to studying just this one thing. In the future, I plan on creating my own energy healing modality, which people can certify through. But for today, I'm going to teach you about just the basics of doing a standard energy healing session. Helping me today is my lovely friend, Kirsty Levitt. People often mistake her as my twin. <laughs> So she's going to be with us today. So everyone say hi. Hello. So why does energy healing work? You live in a vibrational universe. The basis of every physical thing that you see is in fact energy. So you could think of this energetic reality, the quantum field, as the blueprint of physical reality. So anytime you are focused on changing some aspect of this quantum field, you change the physical field because the physical reality must follow suit. The reason that energy healing works then is that when you are introducing your own vibration, which a vibration could be a thought you're thinking, any kind of intention, when you introduce that vibration, you are causing the other person or whatever else you're doing energy on to entrain and resonate with the vibration which you are introducing. The law of this universe is the law of attraction, meaning that the only vibrations which can share space are vibrations which match. And so most commonly, it is the dominant vibration which becomes the vibration which all else matches. So if you are able to maintain a dominant vibration, the person's body or the water or the food, whatever it is that you are introducing that energy to, must come up to match that higher frequency. It must entrain with that frequency and thus the body can no longer be a match to those negative physical conditions which they were experiencing. There are so many energy healing modalities and like every other profession, not everyone can agree. But the one thing everyone does agree on is that wherever the mind goes, energy flows. The most important part of energy is your mind. As you can imagine, knowing this first principle of energy work, it is incredibly important for you to be deliberate about your focus. You can't walk into the room with somebody who's having an ailment and focus on the ailment and be a match to the solution for that person. You have to hold as a picture in your mind the improved state or the process of improvement. The person's body, their energetic field, is going to match that idea which you are now focused on. So, instead of walking in the room with someone with a broken bone and putting focus on the brokenness of that bone, you want to walk in there and focus your mind on anything that is a positive vibrational state, such as the healed bone, a completely healed and healthy bone, or white light potentially. And you can focus on anything like that that will help the person resonate with that improved state. You can also focus on a process like pulling negative energy out of that bone and then suturing the bone back up. Most important thing is that you're focused on whatever you want the end result to be. You're not focusing on the problem as it currently stands. All people are capable of energy work. 
It is true that some are born with this innate talent and the innate drive and intention to be doing healing work, but there is not one person walking this planet that cannot help to heal another person. So let's talk about why we would want to traditionally use our hands in an energy healing session. Knowing that the number one most important thing involving energy work is where the mind is going. It's because naturally the energy flows through your body in a specific pattern and the major output for that energy flow is in your hands. It's a point that the Chinese call the Lao Gong point. It's right here in the center of your hand. So if you take this middle finger and you put it down towards the center of your hand, that output is going to be right where that finger hits, basically in the center of your palm. Naturally, when you are around somebody who needs energy healing, somebody who would benefit by your energy, your energy will start flowing, which is why commonly people who are healers or who are attuned to their own frequency and energy will start to notice their hands getting hot whenever they're around somebody who's sick or somebody who's feeling emotionally negative. It's because that person's energy is now calling forth the energy from the person who has just walked in the room. Anytime you're around somebody who has a need for energy, that energy will start to speed through the channels and be sucked, for lack of a better word, out of this point in your hand. And that speed with which that energy starts leaving creates a friction, which is why you feel that intense heat that we so often associate with energy work. The next thing to understand about energy work is that it's not really us that is healing the other person. All we are doing is introducing a resonance which is more beneficial to them. We are acting as a catalyst. We are providing an offering which is a frequency, and it's the person's choice to match that frequency. If you are introducing a dominant frequency, chances are they are going to accept and adopt that frequency and thus match it. That is why healing actually occurs. Breathing amplifies life force and thus it amplifies energy. That's why anytime you're doing an energy healing session, you want to be attuned to your breathing. You can amplify energy by breathing and you can bring energy in while you are breathing. That means that if you're feeling like you're being depleted at any point during the session, all you need to do is focus on bringing in energy while you're breathing and pushing energy out while you're breathing out. Breath is a totally invaluable tool when it comes to energy healing. Every one of you is going to be tuning into energy in a different way. So when you're doing an energy work session, you want to pay attention to the mental images you're receiving or being inspired to hold on to. Those images which it seems most intuitively would help the person that you're working on. You want to be attuned to the sensations in your body. Quite often when you're doing energy work on other people, there's a transference, meaning that they may not be registering what's going on, but your own body will register what's going on. So you'll start to register the pain that they're feeling, and you'll start to feel it when the energy moves. You may even experience releases of that energy through your own body. You also want to be tuned into the emotions that you're feeling because some people are much more emotionally intuitive, meaning that it is through your emotional heart centers that you will be registering what is going on with the per person you're working on and where that inspires you to go with them. Another thing is you want to tune into what they call spiritual intuition, which is just knowing. So you may just know that this color energy is supposed to go into this area of a person's body. You want to go with that. So not only being super, super perceptive as to what your body is perceiving from the person, but also where your intuition wants you to go with this. And so rather than be afraid of doing harm to somebody, I want you to just realize that you can let your intuition inspire you towards doing whatever it is that your intuition is telling you needs to happen with the person. So it's not like there is a right or wrong way to energy heal. There's not really a better or worse way to energy heal. because energy healing is going to manifest itself in this practitioner differently than it does in this practitioner. You want to use whatever modality you have the most intention invested in. Whatever is the most believable modality for you. Because the more believable it is to you, the stronger your mind is about that concept, the higher vibration you're holding. In my personal opinion, it's always best to start an energy healing session and end an energy healing session by washing your hands. Water is an incredible purifier of energies. It easily neutralizes energies that are attaching to your hands, anything that you've brought to the energy session. So washing your hands, specifically in cold water, is a good way to start this whole process. 
So another great way to start an energy healing is by bringing energy in through your own body. We call this running energy. So you want to close your eyes and you want to visualize that there's a cord that is going from the top of your head all the way down your spine, down through your root chakra to the center of the earth. And you can imagine it hooking into the center of the earth. And from there you want to pull the energy in a spiral motion. So you're visualizing this energy spiraling up through your legs, through the core of your body, up past your head, as many feet as you'd like to take it. I usually take it about three feet past my head and then spiraling back down out through your hands. You can do this process, visualize this process for as long as it takes you to start to feel the energy accumulating in your hands. So you want to feel that heat or tingling, any kind of sensation which would indicate that that energy is actually flowing through your hands. If you want, you can use the breath to help amplify this whole technique which I've just taught you called running energy. Ideally, you will be able to run this energy the entire time you're doing an energy healing session. In the beginning it'll be difficult, meaning that you'll have to come back to it. So while you're in the middle of healing, you want to come back to doing that process quickly and then go back to energy healing. Then what you want to do with the person that you are energy healing is you want to balance them out. So the best way to do this is to start by facing like this. You want them standing away from you. And you want to basically put your hands on both of their shoulders and closing your eyes, you want to visualize as if the two hemispheres of their body are trying to find balance. Some of you may have seen those um, contraptions in the store where it's a, a decoration, has a division, and on the two sides are sand. And you're visualizing tipping the sand back and forth until you're finding equality. Or you can visualize this with energy. So you want to basically imagine the energy going back and forth between the two hemispheres of their body until you get it to a point where there's an even keel, so a perfect balance between the two hemispheres. Then you want to take your two thumbs and you want to take them underneath the occipital bones, which are these two bony points right at the base of the skull. And you want to focus on balancing those so that they're even. It will impress you how quickly the energy in the body will balance. And not only the energy, but the actual physical structure will balance. Sometimes with people it takes some focus, other times it takes none. Literally getting your hands this close will cause them to immediately go into balance. Then, after you have done the occipital bones, you want to come down to the shoulders and do the exact same thing. So place your hands like this on the shoulders, and you want to find that same point of balance in the shoulders. Once you've done that, you want to come down and kneel at the base of a person and put your hands like this on the ridges of their hip bones. And if you look really closely, you'll be able to notice that quite often they're off kilter. When the body energy is not balanced, you'll see one hip that's higher than the other usually. So putting your hand there, you want to focus on that same balancing that you did in the occipital bones and on the shoulders. It's quite common for people to get off balance when you're doing this because you are changing the entire dynamic of how their body is structured. After you've done that, you can come down and do the same thing with the knees. Once you've performed that, it's now time to do an energy sweep on the person that you're running energy on. This is a lot like that technique of running energy that you did with yourself. You want to visualize either the energy running in a straight line, more like a stream, or in spirals if that works better for you. So you come from the back first. You start by collecting the earth energy, and you want to pull it up through their body, up past their head, and then down their head through their arms. You want to do the exact same thing on the front. Before we move on to the next part, I want to mention that there is another way to run energy which works just as well for some people. That is that you're pulling in energy from the earth up to about your Dantian area or here to your solar plexus area. Simultaneously, you are drawing an energy, universal energy, from your head and you're causing that energy to meet here. That meeting of energies 
universal energy and earth energy is going to cause a type of a reaction. And you're going to push that energy of the collection of those two energies out through your hands. That's one way that can really work for people when they're running energy through their hands. And one way is not better than another way. It's just some things work for some people and other things work better for other people. In China, this is the main modality that people use to do energy work because they're all about the concept of yin-yang, which is polar energies meeting. In fact, many of the practitioners there have developed this type of an ability to such a degree that when they pull these two polar energies together at their Dantian area, they're able to actually physically shock people with their energy. Hello and welcome back. We all love nachos, don't we? But in today's world, the cheeses are so processed and full of chemicals. In the next segment, Joy Houston from Whole Foods in America is going to show us how to make delicious vegan nachos cheese. Don't go anywhere. Watch this. We are going to make a fun and delicious snack of nacho cheese. Now, of course, we're going to stay vegan. We're actually even going to stay raw with this recipe. So we are going to need a fat other than dairy to make this cheese. Now, we've made some cashew recipes. I'll put a link below so you have uh, some recipes, other nut recipes that we could try uh, that, are, that are cheese recipes based on nuts. Today's recipe is going to be based on macadamia nuts. So macadamia nuts, you can find the raw variety. My local store was out of them, so I'm actually using the standard easy-to-find roasted macadamia nuts and that will be the base of our cheese. Now in order to break up the fat from a nut and turn it soft enough that it'll actually become nacho cheese, we are going to need the full power of the Vitamix. Um, you can also use a Blendtec. A standard blender is not going to give you a very awesome result on this cheese. You could try it. Um, what's going to happen is you're going to come up with something that's sort of like uh, ricotta cheese. It's not quite ever going to get smooth for you the way that the Vitamix or a Blendtec, a high speed blender uh, will do. So we're going to go ahead and put the cheese together by starting with our macadamia nuts. Now to give it a nice cheesy color and because I just will not let up on trying to convince people to get turmeric, this amazing powerful superfood into your diet, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, helps fight Alzheimer's and arthritis. It's just a really amazing and underused superfood. So once again, I'm including it in a recipe here for you in hopes that you will start enjoying it in your diet in a lot of different ways. Um, now to give it a little cheesy flavor, we're going to cheat and use nutritional yeast. And when we combine that uh, with the lemon here, this will help break up the fats. So the tartness of the lemon uh, combined with the nutritional yeast and the salt, I think gives it a really authentic uh, cheesy flavor. Now <clears throat> we're going to salt this. Now you can sort of add salt as you go. I've made this recipe several times so I know how much I like. A quarter to a half teaspoon is the best place to start and then you can step it up from there if you feel like it needs a little bit more salty flavor. Now this is the base of the recipe. I like a little kick to my nacho cheese, so I'm gonna go ahead and add some cayenne. But cayenne is really going to fire up once it gets in there with the liquid of the lemon. It's gonna be nice and spicy, whereas if I taste it with my finger, it's really not gonna be that fiery. But once it, mix it, it mixes in, it does become quite hot. So take it easy if you're not one to enjoy spice. Cayenne has amazing uh, health benefits as well. It really gets in the body and shakes things up and makes sure that things are moving, so I like to include that as well. Uh, so even if you're not into spice, you might want to just add a little dash so you know you're getting a little in your diet. Uh, so now we're going to go ahead and whip this up. Let me see. We may need our plunger here. We have a uh, we have our spatula just in case. So my my plunger's not handy, but we may need it. I'm gonna turn this off so you can hear me clearly. I'm gonna let this go at about a medium temperature. I have this at about seven. And what I want is the sort of paste from the bottom of the blender to keep going with those macadamia nuts before we turn it all the way up on high. Now, while this is running, you're gonna see me just put some salsa together in this food processor. You're gonna be able to take this base and just add, stir in once it's done. You can hand stir in some minced jalapeno if you want it spicy. If you don't want it spicy but you want a lot of flavor, 
you can just stir in some very finely minced tomato and some finely minced uh, cilantro and you're gonna have a great nacho cheese. Me, I really love the flavor, so I'm just gonna make a little fresh salsa and when my cheese is done, I'm gonna stir them together and I will have a nacho cheese that has a little extra consistency from the salsa. So while this is making noise, I will pop over here and make the salsa and we will be ready to rock quite quickly. Perfect. Now let's see here. A little bit more than that. Okay, here my, I heard this change, I heard the sound change and gave some attention to this blender. As soon as the, the sound sort of goes up an octave, you know now the blades are spinning at the bottom of the Vitamix and you need to pop over there and give it some love. You can use the tamper and get everything headed much more down toward the blade. I'm going to use the spatula here and we're going to fire this back up in just a second. Our salsa is perfect. That was an easy, easy blend. I used half of a jalapeno, two cups of tomatoes, um, about three quarters of a cup of cilantro and salt that to taste and add lime for your liquid or lemon if you don't have lime handy. And that'll give you a nice, simple salsa. You can either layer it and do the cheese with the salsa on top, but I personally like to mix it in. So let's finish this up and we'll have a delicious snack. Okay, perfect. So that got nice and creamy. Again, you want to be watching for the mixture to be coming up the sides of the blender, blacked out, back door into the middle, so it should look like a little four-leaf clover while it's spinning all around. We're going to transfer this now to a bigger bowl so that we can hand mix in whatever ingredients you want to your nacho cheese. Now, it's funny, next time you're at the movies, I hate to even tell you to try that horrible stuff, but if one of your friends is having some nachos, uh, dip a chip into that and give it a try. It doesn't really taste like any real cheese anyway. <laughs> so the fact that we're like replacing it with nuts, I think you'll find that this is a really delicious and satisfying snack. And uh, that is actually better than the like nasty hydrogenated stuff that they're serving at the movies nowadays. And God only knows what's in that stuff, right? It's crazy. I wonder if there's any cheese in it actually. So it's a little difficult to get everything out from under the blender. So you want to take a nice little skinny spatula and get under there and get everything you can. I have a mess here. Oh, that is creamy and delicious just like that. But I want to go a little more crazy. I want to have more of a um, salsa flavor to my nacho cheese. So I'm going to go ahead and spoon in. I like about three tablespoons to four tablespoons in mine. So I'm going to start with three. And kind of fold this in here. All right. So you can see it also gives it some really, really, really pretty flecks of green from the cilantro and from the tomato. I just could use just a tiny bit more. Again, I like it spicy, so you feel it out and see where you're at. There we go. That's what. That's how I like it. Okay. Perfect. Okay, now from hand mixing this in, of course our bowl is not going to be really pretty, so we can transfer this to a beautiful bowl, add some fresh cilantro on top to have some nice presentation, and then we will just serve it up. Now, the typical thing to serve up 
um, nacho cheese would be tortilla chips, right? <laughs> um, I'm going to suggest that you forego the tortilla chips altogether. If you must eat tortilla chips, then let's do the baked ones and let's really take a look at the ingredients on there. Um, because it just like regular corn tortillas, there should be a very simple ingredient list, right? Maybe some uh, corn, bicarbonate, lime. It should be very, very simple ingredients. So if you look on there and you see some science experiment lists of stuff on your chips, like forget about that. Go for the very simple chips. But my recommendation is going to be that you forget all that altogether and that you simply mandolin slice some uh, some carrot, some jicama, and then squeeze a little fresh lime over that and just a little bit of salt, and you'll have a delicious, healthy alternative to chips that's far more healthy, full of fiber and nutrients, and it tastes just as amazing as chips do anyway. You get that crunch, you get the spicy, delicious, creamy cheese, and voila, you have a delicious snack. So here is your raw vegan version of nacho cheese. Good stuff. Hello and welcome back. It's yoga time. There are so many different types of yoga and sometimes it feels really overwhelming and then we don't do anything. In the next segment, Emily McNabb is going to show us how to incorporate very beneficial yoga twists into our daily lives. So grab your yoga mat and start making a change today. Let's have a look. Today we'll go ahead and walk through some twists to help mobilize the thoracic spine. So to begin, we'll go ahead and start with a seated spinal twist. Cross your right knee in front of the body and then cross that left foot on the other side. If this is already difficult to place the entire sole of the left foot down on the ground to end, keep that hip down, straighten the bottom leg. It'll help keep the hip down. Create a second spine with your left hand back behind and tent the fingertips just so you can sit up nice and tall. Reach the right arm up toward the sky. And then take in a deep inhale. As you exhale, twist and bring that right elbow to the inside. From here, with every inhale, lift up, create more space. And with every exhale, twist a little bit farther. You can repeat these inhales and exhales until you feel that you've twisted as far as you can go. Take in one more inhale, and on your last exhale, slowly release that arm and come back to the center. And then switch legs. Again, if it's too difficult to keep that hip down on the ground, always straightening the bottom leg. Create a second spine with the right hand, reaching the left arm up, Take in an inhale, exhale, and twist into that space. With every inhale, lifting up. And with every exhale, twisting a little bit farther, using that arm. On your last inhale, and exhale, coming back to the center. Going into our second twist, it can be a little bit more challenging to only mobilize the thoracic spine and to keep, keep the hips square. So coming into rotated chair, first coming into chair pose, bending the knees deeply, sending the tailbone back like you're sitting back into a chair and reaching the arms up overhead. Shoulders melting down the back, bring the hands to Anjali Mudra heart center. From here, bringing the left elbow to the outside of the right thigh. Once the elbow is placed there, bring the palms together and search for the sternum using the thumbs, pressing the chest up. Now it's important to look down at the knees. Make sure that one knee isn't in front of the other. The tendency is that one knee will sneak in front of the other and then you're no longer rotating simply from your belly button. Reaching the chest up toward the sky, take in a deep inhale, and as you exhale, come back to the center, reaching the arms up overhead, straighten those legs, give them a break for Tadasana Mountain Pose. 
Going into the other side for a rotated chair, again coming into Utkatasana chair pose, reaching the arms overhead, sitting low, bringing the hands to Anjali Mudra heart center, and then bringing the right elbow to the outside of the left thigh. Once that elbow is planted, bring the palms together and then reach the thumbs toward the middle of the chest, opening the heart up toward the sky. Make sure that the knees are still in alignment. Go ahead and look down. And whenever you feel comfortable with the alignment in the knees, maybe bring the chest farther up toward the sky. One more deep inhale. And as you exhale, coming back to the center, reaching the arms back overhead, straightening the legs for Tadasana Mountain Pose. Coming into a more restorative twist, a twist with which to end your yoga practice, you begin on your back. Bring the knees into the chest once flat on the back. Give them a hug. Tee the arms out to the side, palms facing up and then release the legs over to the right side. Slowly turn the head, look into the left palm, completing the twist all the way through the spine. Once you're here and the legs are heavy and the shoulders are released, take in three deep inhales. One last inhale. And as you exhale, bringing one knee back into the chest and then the other. Slowly release the legs to the left and gently turn the head to look into the right palm. Once here and the shoulders are heavy and the knees are heavy, begin your three deep breaths. One more inhale. And as you exhale, bringing one knee in and then the other. Give the knees a nice hug once again. And then slowly roll over to the right side. Once on the right side, curled up into a ball, placing the left palm into the ground. Release the neck as you press the body up. Back into your seated cross-legged position. So to begin a salutation, start at the top of the mat, coming into Tadasana Mountain Pose. In Tadasana Mountain Pose, we have our toes touching and our heels just slightly apart, so the outsides of our feet are parallel. And then have a downward engagement of the tailbone and then an upward engagement of the belly button. So you, your core is nice and engaged. The arms down alongside the body, the palms face forward, the chin just slightly tucked, a nice broad chest. You want to feel released here and with strong alignment at the same time. So from Tadasana Mountain Pose, inhale as you bring the arms up overhead. And as you exhale, stretch the arms out, bring the chest out and then all the way down, coming in Uttanasana Forward Fold. From Uttanasana Forward Fold, make sure that the body is nice and heavy and the legs still straight. Place the hands on the shins and reach the crown of the head forward, still with that downward engagement of the belly button. Just stretching the spine and lengthening the spine out. Taking a deep inhale. And as you exhale, fold back down over the legs, bringing the chin all the way back down. From Uttanasana forward fold again, place the hands down on the ground, step one foot back and then step the other foot back, coming into plank pose. In plank pose, it's important to remember that the hands are right underneath the shoulders. So the first transition that you can take for your vinyasa is lower the knees down to the mat and untuck the toes. Then lower the chest and the chin down to the ground and arching the back. Then slide the chest forward. Lift the chest off of the ground just a few inches and the hands stay underneath the shoulders. It's important to remember that the gaze is on the ground here in your cobra pose and the toenails are on the mat. So you're not crunching that lumbar spine, it's just a lengthening. Taking a deep inhale here, 
Exhale, fold back down onto the mat. Tuck the toes back behind you. Send the hips all the way to the heels. And then simply straighten the legs coming into your downward dog, your upside down triangle. From downward dog, bend the knees, look in between the hands and step heel toe to the top of the mat. To stretch the back. Place the hands on the shins, reach the crown of the head forward, coming back into that flat back. And as you exhale, lower back down over the legs. Inhale the arms up overhead once again, just as you began. And as you exhale, bring the hands down through Anjali Mudra and then back to Tadasana Mountain Pose. So the second variation for Surya Namaskar A involves Chaturanga Dandasana. So begin the exact same way you did in the first variation in Tadasana Mountain Pose. The toes touch the heels slightly apart, the tailbone drop, the belly button lift, Shoulders release down, palms face forward. Inhale, the arms up overhead. Look in between the hands. As you exhale, fly the chest forward and then down over the legs. Uttanasana, forward fold. Place the hands on the shins. Reach the head forward, lengthen the spine. Take in an inhale. And as you exhale, folding back down over the legs. Plant the hands down, bend the knees. And step one foot back, the other foot back to plank pose. From plank pose, Inhale for your vinyasa, and as you exhale, lower halfway down in one piece. Keep the body above the ground, and then inhale up to your upward dog. Lifting the hips and the knees in upward dog, so that you're not crunching the lower back, and then exhale back to downward dog. From downward dog, take in about three inhales. And whenever you're done with your breathing sequence, bend the knees, look in between the hands, and step back to the top of the mat. To end Surya Namaskar A, place the hands on the shins, reach the head forward, take it another inhale. Exhale, fold back down over the legs. Inhale the arms back up overhead. And as you exhale, bring the hands through Anjali Mudra and back down to Tadasana. Thank you so much for watching. Please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to see some more videos. Please also go to thehillsfitness.com for more information about classes. Hello and welcome back. The final segment of today's show is all on secondhand cigarette smoke. The debate is over and the science is clear. Secondhand smoke is a serious health hazard and causes premature death. Secondhand cigarette smoke is full of dozens of cancer causing chemicals. All we can do is give people the facts, inform them and then let them make their own decisions. In the next segment we will listen to some real life stories. Let's listen to this. This is about improving and saving people's lives. Unfortunately, because of the secondhand smoke in the air, I had an asthma attack within 10 minutes, so I was forced to leave. The cancer and how I got it was due to my exposure to secondhand smoke in all those smoky clubs for all those years. You're asking the employee to choose between their health and making a living. That's just not fair. Everybody has a dream. They want to be able to support their family. They want to be able to, to support themselves. They want to be responsible. But the reality is that these kinds of things are going to be in your workplace. How can you when you're exposed this way? I'm grateful to be here today, to be able to say unequivocally that the debate is over. The science is clear. Secondhand smoke is not a mere annoyance, but a serious health hazard that causes premature death and disease in children and non-smoking adults. In the course of the past 20 years, the scientific community has reached consensus on this point. I've been a waitress for 40 years to earn a decent living for, for my daughter and myself. My doctor told me I had a smoker's tumor, and therefore uh, I'm dying. I never smoked a day in my life. I never smoked. The air was blue where I worked. And I'm dying of lung cancer from secondhand smoke. 
for myself, I feel that uh, I spent 40 years working in the industry, and uh, now I'm coming out to die. And so I want people to know that, uh, to me, that uh, there was too much exposure to the, the known health hazard in the, pro in, in the workplace. Those kinds of atmospheres, bars, restaurants, casinos, are the last vestiges of smoking. I was a very successful, award-winning stand-up comedian who in August uh, 2001 had surgery for a lung cancer that um, was due to my exposure to secondhand smoke and all those smoky clubs for all those 11 years. She's decided that, you know, she needs to tell other people what happened to her and she needs to use her story to motivate people to change. Yeah, yeah, so if you want to catch up with Renee, she's going to be at that meeting tonight, so... Uh, yeah, and everybody should come out. Come it's out. civic. I don't want smokers to smoke. I don't want you to die. But if you choose to do so, I support your personal choice. But please support mine. Don't take me with you. Don't take me with you. An important new conclusion of this report is that smoke-free environments are the only approach, the only approach, that protects non-smokers from the dangers of secondhand smoke. The city of El Paso is about the 21st largest city in the country. We are as far west Texas as you can get and we border with Juarez, Mexico. Well, in the very beginning, which was in November of 2000, I told a reporter that there was no way that we were ever gonna pass such a tough ordinance, a smoking ordinance. My gut instinct was that it would have negative impacts on businesses and that people had the right to determine their own future. As I started really researching and going out and starting asking questions, my opinion started to gradually shift. I learned that there's dozens of cancer-causing chemicals in cigarette smoke. I learned that no manufacturer of filtration systems guaranteed the effectiveness of their system. And I kept saying to all the other elected officials, how can you compromise somebody's life, somebody's health, whether they're in a bar, whether they're in a restaurant, whether they're in a VFW hall? And the majority of the city council agreed with me and we passed that ordinance by a 7 to 1 vote. I don't think it's had a negative impact. We still see the people who used to smoke in our restaurants, and the people who didn't smoke seem to come more often than they used to. So we, we've had really robust sales in the past five years. We have more restaurants than we had before, in spite of El Paso having the toughest smoking ordinance or non-smoking ordinance in the, in, in the state, and one of the toughest in the whole country still. It's been a tremendously positive experience and impact on the city. Lexington is a community of 300,000 people nestled in central Kentucky. Lexington has always been an agricultural center uh, the tobacco background is, is central to our DNA. Smart business people like Mike Scanlon know that we can be proud of our community's past, but we don't want to live in it. And that's the case with the smoke-free initiative we've had in this town. And really what I'm trying to do is show everybody what the future looks like. Mike Scanlon uh, waited in. Yeah. He said, I'm one of the largest restaurant employers in this community. I'm going to take this community smoke-free and I'm going to set an example. And it was an example that spoke loudly. As a businessman, I had been through many communities in Phoenix going smoke-free, and I knew it didn't hurt business. I think part of it gets down to is the decision of how are we going to make our money? And, and how do we explain to ourselves when we drive home with our profits that we're letting our employees get sick and that we're looking at the employees and say, well, if you don't want to work here, then don't. We came to the conclusion that it would be advantageous for us um, to have that competitive advantage where we're smoke-free, where other restaurants aren't, knowing that that's really the way it's going. The biggest single beneficiary from our decision to go smoke-free as a company was our employees. It was our belief that if, if you value your employees as much as we do, 
uh, that you have to take care of them. In the middle of the tobacco belt, we had common sense enough to make smoke-free environments. I know there'll be a lot more healthy, happy families as a result of this. And I think at the end of the day, that's what people sent me to office to do. Secondhand smoke exposure causes heart disease and lung cancer in adults and sudden infant death syndrome and respiratory problems in children. There is no risk-free level of secondhand smoke exposure, with even brief exposure adversely affecting the cardiovascular and respiratory systems. Only smoke-free environments effectively protect non-smokers from secondhand smoke exposure in indoor spaces. Children are most exposed to secondhand smoke in their homes and in their cars. And what we're asking parents to do is to just become aware of the fact that the home is the area where there's the greatest exposure and it's going to have to be the place where a personal commitment is made. What impressed me about this young man, because he was in fifth grade at the time, was how knowledgeable he was. That really encouraged me. My parents were taking me bowling. Unfortunately, because of the secondhand smoke in the air, I had an asthma attack within 10 minutes, so I was forced to leave. We're getting more and more reports that indicate that children are just suffering disproportionately, that asthmatic children are being triggered by people smoking and they're being around smokers. I was really disappointed by this. You know, I came home and I was like, what, how am I ever going to have fun if I'm, my asthma is going to inhibit me from uh, participating in such activities? So my parents, you know, they suggested, why don't you try and do something about it? Amit was there because he felt that children and families needed to have places that they could go were smoke-free. We wanted to be able to provide places in the community where families could go and not have to be affected by the harmful effects of secondhand smoke. I made a presentation representing the children of Lubbock. We also need laws to make our air safer to breathe. And we ended up winning 64% of the vote. Finally, we were going to get a smoking ban in Lubbock. The 1986 Surgeon General's report concluded that simple separation of smokers and non-smokers within the same airspace may reduce but not eliminate secondhand smoke exposure among non-smokers. The current report expands on that finding by concluding that even sophisticated ventilation approaches cannot completely remove secondhand smoke from an indoor space. Because there is no risk-free level of secondhand smoke exposure, anything less cannot ensure that non-smokers are fully protected from the dangers of exposure to secondhand smoke. If I can stop others from having to go through and experience what I had to, they may not have the skills to come through it with laughter. So if I can help do that, then yes, this is a happy ending to a sad story. It takes the business community, it takes the medical community, and it takes the elected official community to say, stand up, that's not fair. And when you can stand up for the good of society, you can die the next day and feel like you have mattered on this earth. I can't say that I'll be the, one to die, the last one to die, but I'm hoping that at least I'll make a difference.
so we've come to the end of another episode. Join us next time for another great show of being well. Remember to live your passion, follow your bliss. Goodbye and be well. <music>